Hi, Chris Glynn here with the Nightlight Podcast. My guest on today's show is author and apocrypha researcher Stephen Strutt, and he's going to be talking about his latest book, Estra's Insights. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. Stephen, great to have you back with us on the show. Firstly, for those who don't know, who was Estrus? Yeah, well, Estrus, that's not his real name. That's the Greek version. His real name is Ezra in Hebrew. Right. And that's the prophet of God who was the leader of Israel spiritually about 500 BC, maybe slightly earlier than that originally. Uh, This is quite a character, Ezra. I've only recently found out how it was possible for Ezra to be alive in like 550 BC and still alive in 1440 BC. This guy, according to Jewish records, lived to be 120 years old. Wow. Right, that, that's very remarkable. He lived that long. And I, I think, that, ladies and gentlemen, that he lived that long because he was willing to fast and pray for 40 days plus, go on a heavenly trip to heaven, and receive amazing visions and dreams that are second to none. Yes. I stated in the introduction of my book that in my opinion, I cannot for the life of me understand why this book has not been honored much more. Because Second Estrus is full of visions and dreams and prophecies. The most important of all talks about the Messiah. And it talks about Jesus being born in 400 years after the time of Ezra. Did it happen? It did. The hallmark of prophecy is its fulfillment. So right there, there's one prophecy and there's another one about it, where, where, where God says, I'm sending my son. I'm sending my son shortly. Just the two prophecies about Jesus are incredible. Wow. Then there's another one about the lost tribes of the children of Israel, the, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Fantastic stuff. Yes. Then there are two chapters on the wrath of God, the 15th and the 16th chapter. I digress, but I should inform you that there are 16 chapters in Second Estrus. And they're long ones. I did come out with an earlier book. One of my second, my second insights book was called Estrus Insights, spelled with a Z, and that is the Greek spelling. But this time I've called it with an S because that's the real spelling. That's how it should be. I see. Now, the difference is this book, Esdras Insights, this is a new edition, if you want to put it, of Esdras with a Z, Insight, but this is a much bigger book. This one does contain first and second Esdras, has both of the Apocrypha books in there, plus it has an extra book in it, one I've compiled, with 4,000 years of biblical history from creation to Christ. Wow, I'd like to read that. And I think you'll find that very powerful. That is very to the point, very strong. That is something I compiled from things that I was taught when I was young. Incredible stuff about history. Just, it's spot on. It still is. But I added comments to that original text in history where I was taught about biblical history when I was young. And I put comments to bring it up to date today so people can relate it to my books and the Bible. Also, I'd like to point out that it was only recently I was very encouraged by this same writer who I learnt about the Bible originally from his texts and his books. He himself stated that if you were to have any books at all in times of trouble, well, let's say for Christians, time of tribulation, he said, I would choose the Bible and the Apocrypha. Really? That's what he said. And it's only recently I noticed, and that's what I've been doing for years, that, wow, that's a great confirmation of what I've been doing. You know, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that others also see it that way. Right. And for people to understand, the Apocrypha is something used to be in the King James Version of the Bible until 1885, when for some reason it was taken out. That's right. Some people say because the Bible was too big, okay, keep the Apocrypha in a separate book. That's one of the reasons given. I can think of others. But anyway, for whatever reason, because the Apocrypha was taken out, the King James Version of the Bible, which is largely read by the Protestants and the Evangelical, unfortunately, the Apocrypha got totally sidelined. Stephen, just let me inform our listeners that I have narrated the second book of Estrus, which you'll find with read-along text on this channel. And it's also available in our new Shopify audiobook store from where you'll be able to download the complete apocrypha that has 15 books including first and second estrus you'll find the link below 
Stephen, I recently recorded the book of Genesis from the Greek Septuagint version of the Bible, which was the Bible that Jesus and his disciples and the early Christians read. And I noticed that the apocryphal books are included in the Septuagint. That's right. That's why I'm, I feel my job is to encourage people to read the Apocrypha, find it, read it, because it gives a lot of insight into many stories in the Bible where it's not complete. Stephen, how do we know that Second Estrus was actually written by Ezra in the 5th century BC? Some scholars think it was composed somewhere between 70 and 220 AD. First of all, as I state in the introduction to my insights books, you cannot understand the things in the Bible, or even the Apocrypha, if you start from a skeptical worldview. Absolutely right. You cannot have a skeptical mind like the intellectuals. It doesn't work. Because scriptures say, Solomon says very clearly in Ecclesiastes that though a man think to know and discover, he can't know. God's hidden everything. Everything is hidden unless you have the right mind and the right heart to understand the truth. You have to, first of all, I'd say you have to be saved. If you're not saved by grace, you won't begin to understand these books. Yes. They don't understand how God can save things thousands of years in advance. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the churches are becoming so intellectual, they don't even believe in prophecy anymore. It's true. It's very sad. This is, this is what happens. So to me, when I look through a book, I don't just read it from the theological side of things or intellectual side of things. I read it and I ask God to speak to my heart. Speak to me about the chapters, verse by verse. And that, then I ask myself, okay, I'm not here to be a skeptic. I'm not here to do too much analysis. It's true we'd like to know when was this written. Was this a pseudepigraphical book or was it actually written by Ezra? Now, I'll tell you, in all the research I've done, Jewish nation says what it says in Hebrew, what it says from the Western point of view, most are in agreement that it's Ezra that wrote this book. Yes. There is many reasons I say that, but most of all, how could you say that somebody hundreds of years after Ezra wrote the things he said? I mean, he's, he's giving you prophecies, he's giving you visions. Why would somebody make that up 500 years later? It, it, there's no sense to that. It's true. There's no logic to that. Unless you understand how God's children get things straight from heaven, receive things from God's spirit, like Ezra did, and somebody who spent 40 days praying and fasting, and his great concern was the anguish of Israel. How can that be written 500 years after the time? It doesn't make sense. That's right. So I'd say a simple answer is read the work. There's a lot of skeptics and people make comments without reading the material. They do. They just go by what somebody else says because it's convenient, that's the, it's the done thing said, and that's the intellectual thing to say, but they don't read the material. That's right. But I'll say, if you take the time to read books like Second Ezra, slowly and carefully, repeatedly, you'll find out that that had to be Ezra, the prophet, because not only did God give him incredible visions and dreams, that's why I've put in First Ezra this time too, because you go to First Ezra afterwards, and here's the funny thing I found really funny with Second Esdras. Esther was typical. He was like us. He was like all of us. He was impatient to get answers from God. Right. He just saw Israel was in this big mess. They were in captivity. Everything bad imaginable being done to Israel. And he's wondering, he's like us and go, why has this happened to us? How long are we going to be in this mess? When are you going to deliver us? You promised you'd deliver us and we wouldn't be in this kind of situation. Right. So it's rather like that with Ezra to start off with. He's sort of a bit cocky and a bit arrogant to start off with, but he soon learns to humble himself before the angel of God. And the funny thing is God does not answer his question right away. He starts talking to Ezra from A to Z. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to deliver you tomorrow. Yeah, I'm the God of Israel. No, he doesn't do that. And, and that's what's interesting. That's why you have to study it really to see the connection God developed with Ezra to be a connection stronger and stronger, but he didn't always answer right away. Why? Because God had a lot to say. God is like this, or Jesus is like this, or God's Spirit is like this. He doesn't have many channels to talk to. It's the same today. He has few that are really willing to listen and tune in. So when he gets a good channel, he will start talking to you from A to Z, because finally he's found somebody who's willing to listen. That's right. And that's exactly how it was with Ezra. And over and over again, you can see this. Now, these things you can only perceive by the Spirit. If you're just an intellectual, just reading for the sake of reading a book and just making a judgment on a book, you will, it will go over your head. Absolutely. You won't even 
begin to understand. But if you're a saved person, truly saved in Jesus by grace, and you read the apocryphal books like this one, you'll be thrilled by it. Yes. You'll find it very exciting because, wow, I can get prophecy too. I wonder if I could get something from God like that. That's incredible, Ezra got. And this, like I said, I'll go even further than that. I'll not only say that I believe it was definitely Ezra who wrote it for many different reasons, which you'll find out when you study the book. And study in my book, Ezra's Insights, study it this time also, not just second Ezra's, but read first Ezra's that's in the book also. Okay. Read it. And you'll see that although God was slow in answering exactly what Ezra was asking for, you look at history, he did answer all of Ezra's prayers. Absolutely. So much so, he allowed Ezra to live 120 years so he'd see the fulfillment of all those things he was asking God for. Now I ask you, since it's so specific in asking God to do this and deliver Israel and do this, and he talked about so many details, how could somebody possibly write that as a, uh, as a pseudepigraphical writer 500 years later? It does not add up. I'm afraid not. It doesn't. That's right. There's no way he could do that. The only way I can describe it, when you're a channel for the Lord, you can feel it and sense it because you have that intimate contact with God. But as I said, another person, it'll go over their head, will not know what they're talking about. And that's just following what Scripture says, that's following exactly what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, okay? So that's all I'll say on that, except to say that I think that everybody should get this book, Esther's Insights, the new edition one, because you can see that God talks to his prophets, he gives them visions and prophecies which are fulfilled, which you can read there, as I said, in First Ezra. You can see all being fulfilled fantastically. In fact, Ezra ended up, together with Nehemiah, they rebuilt Israel. And he you know, rebuilt the temple and rebuilt the wall. And Ezra led people in prayer. And here's a fantastic thing about Ezra. Here's another thing that proves it was Ezra. Did you know in that time, in that book, there was no more records of the Torah? It had all been destroyed by the enemies, by the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylon, burned it all up. Really? So if you read carefully, second Ezra, you'll find what was the last thing God had Ezra do. He said, choose these five special writers who are very fast at writing, and I'll write down to you the history from Genesis until your time. He wrote it all down. Wow, that's true. So they had got the Torah back again. Ezra did that. And because he did that, 100 years later or less, he was highly honored by Israel, and he was the one as a, as a Lord, they called him Lord Ezra by the time, he came out and read him the scriptures, all the scriptures, which God had re-given back to him. So when you know stuff like that, there's no way a pseudepigraphical writer could have written that 500 years after the fact. It does not make, it doesn't add up. That's what I would say on that. Nightlight Insights. Stephen, please walk us through some of the amazing visions and prophecies that are found in the second book of Esdras. It's categorized as an apocalyptic book because it contains significant prophecies about the destruction of Babylon and the judgments upon the wicked at the end of days, which will no doubt be of particular interest to those of us who feel that we are now living in the end of days. Okay, so yes, this is in chapter two of my book talk about the calling of the bride. It's something I think is very, very important for people to know about. Because in the time of Ezra, Israel had gone really astray. And you'll find out that this chapter talks about Israel personified, or the bride, or Zion personified. Here it says, and she talks about here, the mother who bore them says to them, go my children, because I'm a widow and forsaken. That's exactly how Ezra felt, forsaken because they had disobeyed God and they paid a high price and their enemies came and destroyed Israel, literally, especially Jerusalem at that time. Of course, Israel was much greater destroyed at the time of the Romans, 70 AD, but that's another story. Right. But so chapter two is talking about actually two women. It's talking about Z Zion personified and it's talking okay. about the bride of Christ as well. It's all about both of them. Uh, that's why I think it's a very, very important chapter. Yes. Well, that's a synopsis, I would say, on chapter 2, keeping it very short. And, of course, the spirit of Zion is talking. And, and it's very interesting because later on in this book, Zion is talking to, as a woman, he's personified as a woman or a spirit of a woman. She comes and talks to Ezra when, when God's angel has told Ezra 
going fast inside a field of flowers. And he does that, and suddenly this woman shows up crying and weeping while Ezra's in his meditation of prayer. And he says to the woman, look woman, what are you doing all this weeping for? Don't you know about Zion? You're weeping for yourself. But she tells an amazing story, which also is a vision and prophecy, which people need to see, where she is telling about the history of Israel. And here's another fantastic thing in this book. If you read these prophecies and visions, you'll find out it tells you the exact age of the earth. Wow. Here in Second Estes. It shows you the earth was 3,000 years from creation until Solomon. Right. And then another 3,000 years from Solomon till the present time. How could they know that? How? Because God knows everything. Yes. That's the wonder it, it, of the Apocrypha books and the Bible, is that God is the one in charge, not man and his intellect. It's the Spirit of God that's in charge. Right. Well, there's a gem there. There's in these chapters where Zion shows up as a woman personified, and then strangely, she turns in to a big city right in front of Ezra's eyes, and it almost drives him crazy. Gosh. And he calls on the angel, and he says, what's happened here? Oh, what happened to my mind? How can a woman turn into a city? He's totally befuddled by it. Right. But you can read, that's another exciting story in this book. A second, right. it's fantastic. That's one of them. Another one is, there's this three-headed eagle. And here's, uh, this is something that could not be done 500 years later. There is a three-headed eagle where Ezra connects with Daniel 7. He calls him his brother Daniel, and he talks about this eagle. He's obviously talking about Rome. Right. And you read it, and you find out he was talking about Rome 500 years, or, yeah, almost 500 years before the Roman Empire came into existence, and he says it was linked with Daniel 7. It's exactly correct. Amazing. Completely correct. And I would say, ladies and gentlemen, and I said in my introduction in the latest edition, Ezra's insights, in my opinion, I think it's very wrong that Ezra's writings were relegated and you only really hear about Ezra in the historical books way back, you know, when they should be in the book of the prophets. They should. In fact, in my opinion, the, book of, the books of Ezra should be right after Daniel. Absolutely. 16 chapters in 2nd Ezra alone, plus the history in uh, the history books of Ezra itself and Nehemiah, some are combined in Ezra to be Ezra and Nehemiah, some is just Ezra, but these are all canonical books. These have been canonical books, all of them. I checked them. Ezra and Nehemiah is still canonical, but they've kicked out Second Ezra and First Ezra, which is a big mistake. It is. What is the difference in First Ezra and the Book of Ezra? Well, basically, just the chapter order. The order of chapters is different. When you come to the First Ezra in my book, you'll find out it's very similar to the Book of. Ezra and Nehemiah, yes. but the chapters are in a slightly different order, for whatever reason that is. That's, that's open to question why, but it's still very interesting. I think that what happens is different scribes at different times copied down the, the books of the Torah, depending where they were, some in captivity, some in difficult circumstances, but the Bible has been copied many, many times. That's why we have so many different versions of it. Yes. And I think it's the same, the same thing with some of the Apocrypha books too, we have different versions. But I find this one, there are 15 Apocrypha books it used to be in the King James Version of the Bible until 1885. Two of them were, First and Second Estrus. So you imagine, they were there for almost 2,000 years and they got kicked out 100 years ago without rhyme or reason. They were. Big mistake. Very, very big mistake. So there you've got that chapter I was telling you about the three-headed eagle, and that describes Rome. But then it also talks about a lion coming along, which is the Lion of Judah and comes and rebukes this eagle because it still exists in the end of days. Yes. And it, it describes things get worse and worse. And in, in real effect, it describes three antichrists, just like Nostradamus did. And then the Lord, the, the lion of Judah, he tells off this monster and he says, you are to be destroyed. You have destroyed my earth. You have destroyed the righteous. You've done nothing but trouble. So don't worry, the monster who started in Rome and ends up with the Antichrist, it gets destroyed by the line of Judah. So that's another fantastic sound. Here, this is written 2,500 years ago. How can this guy know this stuff? <laughs> A Bible prophecy is fantastic stuff. It's the most interesting stuff, I think. 
lighting your path through the end times. You're with Nightlight. The 15th and 16th chapters are pretty scary stuff because they're talking about the end times and they're talking about the wrath of God and they're also talking about this Babylon, like similar to Revelation 17, 18. This Babylon, the great monster. Right. A false system. And talks about prostitution. Now, to add another thing here, it's very interesting detail. In these two chapters, it also says that one of the daughters of the great whore is an Asian prostitute. Wow, that's interesting. In other words, prostitution is a big thing in the East and it feeds the big whore of the West. This is written 2,500 years ago. Wow. How could they know such stuff? Because it's true. I, I thought at the time, no, that can't be right. I investigated it. Do you know how much prostitution there is in countries like Thailand and countries over there in the Far East that prostitute themselves to the rich of the West who go there on holiday? I mean, it's sickening. It is. But that's what they do. You know, in places like Thailand, you can be strung up and killed for having drugs. But child prostitution, that's okay. You see, this world is really sick. Well, God wouldn't have them nailed there. He called them Asia. He says, I'm going to judge you like I'm going to judge the big whore because of that sort of thing, child prostitution. I mean, it infuriates me just thinking about it. And God bless these guys who just made a movie against these things. Well done. Well done, those who stick up for the crimes on this planet against it. Anyway, God nailed it on the same topic there in this book. Second Estus, read the 15th to 16th chapter, you'll see it right there. See how the nations prostitute their own children for the sake of the rich. Sickening, really sickening. It's never completely dark when you're listening to Nightlight. Nightlight. Just for the interest of you, you and your readers, I was inspired to make a new class on my audio channel. But no, I never heard anybody say this before, but we got a new inspiration and it is about the bride, I call it the warrior bride, and it's about the bride going into the wilderness in Revelation 12. Now nobody has never explained this to my liking, but I was receiving that actually those three and a half years of so-called tribulation is a time of training. It's a time of training, but I won't say any more about it now. Please go on my audio site, it's my latest video, and my, uh, my channel on YouTube is at Stephen with PH. Dot strut, and you'll find one's called the Warrior Bride of Christ. And if you'd like to hear a lot more from Stephen, I do encourage you to subscribe to his YouTube channel, and I'm including the link below. Nightlight, keeping you in tune with the times. Stephen, one of the most outstanding prophecies in Second Estrus are the prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah, the Son of God. Tell us about these. So in chapter 7, verse 13, it says this, For my son, the Messiah, shall be revealed with those who are with him, and those who remain shall rejoice in 400 years, and after these years all who draw human breath. Now you'll have to read my book in order to get it in that right context, because there's a few, if you change just two words, you alter the meaning. What it really says is, For my son, the Messiah, shall be revealed with those who are with him. And those who remain shall rejoice in 400 years, and after these years my son the Messiah shall die for all who draw human breath. That's what it's supposed to say. Now, some of copies have altered it slightly, and it's very clever. You alter something with a word here and there, and people don't understand what it's talking about, and that's exactly what Satan loves to do. That's true. And those who work for him, they like to hide the truth, cover it up, say it doesn't exist, or water it down. They do. But anyway, I know it does say, God said his son, the Messiah, and he says, my son, look, for my son, the Messiah, shall be revealed in 400 years. So how could that possibly be written by Christians in, in the New Testament? It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up. There's no sense to that. You wouldn't write like that. You could not write in the future as if it's in the past, but it doesn't work that way. Right. Because things are discerned spiritually, they're given spiritually, they're not, they're not just intellectual, mental concepts. You know, that, that's the point. So there it talks about verse 13 very clearly, and I say that again, for my sons, God the Father speaking, my son the Messiah shall be revealed with those who are with him, and those who remain shall rejoice in 400 years. After these years, my son the Messiah shall die for all who draw 
human breath. Now the thing is this, God's very clever because he probably knew that there was going to come some people later try and change things, alter the text, shelve it away so people couldn't see. But it actually says the same thing twice in this book and they didn't manage to cover it up. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so that's what makes it very exciting. This is the seventh chapter. But it not only talks about the Messiah in chapter 7, it talks about some very amazing stuff where it talks about what it's like when we die. It talks about seven days of silence, right? Seven days of silence when you die. Mm -hmm. And so you can think about what you did in your life. You've got time to contemplate, did I do the right thing or not? You get to see what happens to the wicked and what happens to the righteous. Some go to nice mansions and some go someplace horrible. And I think God is getting a lot of people to contemplate their lives in those seven days, according to this Apocalypse of Second Exodus. And I know God. He's, he's so merciful and loving. I think in those seven days, those who have done wrong things are going to think, hey, wait, I don't want to go to that bad place. What have I got to do to avoid it? I'm convinced that God is so loving that he wants millions of people to get saved, even if it's the last minute. As long as they kowtow to Jesus and God, right? If they do that, God's going to forgive them. That's what I, I see. God is going to forgive a lot of people. I think so, too. I don't think it's just a few people who are making it. No, not at all. And, and if you want to know more on that topic, like I said, please see my latest audio, The Warrior Bride of Christ, on my audio channel, because it talks about this. Okay. Hey, look at this verse in that same chapter. I would call it the Great White Throne Judgment. This is in uh, verse, chapter 7, 15. The Most High shall be revealed upon the seat of judgment, and compassion shall pass away, and patience shall be withdrawn. This is just before the white, Great White Throne Judgment. But only judgment shall remain. Truth shall stand, faithfulness shall grow strong, a recompense shall follow, and a reward shall awake. Unrighteous deeds shall not sleep. Here's verse 16. Then the pit of torment shall appear, and opposite shall be the place of rest, and the furnace of hell shall be disclosed, and opposite the paradise of delight. Very interesting, because Jesus talked about in the story of Lazarus, about a place like heaven, or the Garden of Eden being right next to hell. And this is borne out by many stories I've read. They say exactly the same thing. It says also the same thing in Jewish history. I've got, a, actually I've got a very good link to send you excellent link where I got a lot of my information you know, when I write about the earth being hollow and, and also second Ezra also talks about the earth being hollow in about five different chapters okay God doesn't hide it God's not the one hiding how the earth is made no it's man that hides it so that also that's a very important point in this book he talks about the earth being hollow God calls the earth like the womb that's how he describes it the God uh, sows souls into the womb of the earth from time to time I mean he's it couldn't be clearer than showing the earth is hollow than in this book. That's why I think it's very important for people who want to know the true makeup of the earth. Because as you know, we are lied to about everything. That's right. I studied science at university, and I like science a lot. Nothing against science. But science is supposed to mean the word I know. It means I know in Latin. But unfortunately, very modern science, it doesn't seem to know anything. They're just spouting out lies nearly all the time. It's true. That's the problem. Just nothing but lies and garbage. You know, soon they'd be having us believing that we are, we are green frogs just because they told us the same thing a hundred times. <laughs> it's, it's crazy how dogma of information is becoming under the Antichrist system to this day. That's how it is. It's going downwards. You know, but you, just because they tell you you're a frog, you don't have to believe it. Yeah, I'll tell you, you don't have to believe that. Like a candle in the night, it's nightlight. There's one thing I'd like to bring out. I'd like to bring out this for any Jewish audience who are very interested in what happened, or also Zionist Jews, or also Christians, what on earth happened to the ten missing tribes of Israel? What happened to these guys? It's been a mystery. Because it, it's quite a mystery. I've heard all kinds of stories. I've researched it. Some say, oh yeah, they went to um, different countries and even went to America, etc. But the more you investigate, you don't find any evidence of that. But here's something very odd. It says in which chapter is this? I'm going to find, forget it myself. Chapter 13. Unlucky for some. <laughs> Look at this. This is talking about a time when Assyria, they came and took the ten northern tribes of Israel, which was prophesied by the prophets Isaiah and others that would happen because of disobedience of Israel. Anyway, they became 
captors of the Assyrian Empire, a lot of them were killed. But then something strange happened. Now here's talking about some of the remaining people of the ten lost tribes of Israel. And this is the 13th chapter, verse 17. But they formed this plan for themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the nations and go to a more distant region where mankind had never lived, that there, at least, they might keep their statutes, which they have not kept in their own land, their own land of Israel, of course. And they went, look at this, and they went in by the narrow passages of the Euphrates River. Wow. Now, that is heavy stuff, because, you know, uh, the Euphrates itself is a very spiritual place, as mentioned in the book of Revelation. Right. It's in chapter 8, 9, and also the last chapters of Revelation, talk, chapter 16. It's very linked to the tribulation and the wrath of God and judgment. Euphrates is, you know. Seems to be. Bound spirits in there waiting to slay a third of mankind and stuff like that. So this Euphrates River is important stuff. But somehow or other, these people were tired of being disobedient and getting kicked out of Israel. So they made this plan with God. Look, we want to be obedient. We want to be somewhere where we're not influenced by too many outside influences, where we can dedicate ourselves to the Torah, dedicate ourselves to the truth. What are we going to do? And God said, well, I'm preparing a land for you, but it's not here. It's a distant place. And I'm convinced, as many others are, that they went, as it says here, it says it in, word, in easy word, they went in by the narrow passages of the Euphrates River. Sometimes the Euphrates River dries up. But anyway, they found these tunnels, these passages were going down into the earth. That's what happened to them. And they disappeared inside the earth, as has happened with many civilizations at different times of history. You look it up and you'll find that not only the ten lost tribes of Israel, there's been many civilizations throughout history who have disappeared underground for one reason or the other, because of persecution, because of privation, because of crops failing, all kind of reasons. I, as a Christian, would never suggest anybody go underground. No, I wouldn't do that personally, even no matter what the problems are on the outer surface of the earth. And there has been good reasons why people have felt they had to in the past, all kind of enemies and things. But anyway, I thought that just to quote that to you there from this chapter, 13th chapter, 2nd Estrus, because it says very clearly, they went in by the narrow passage of Euphrates River. And there's a lot more on that, that others also say the same thing. And it, it even mentions the name of the place, which has been verified by people in modern times. Look at this. For at that time, the Most High performed signs for them, stopped the channels of the river, until it passed over through that region there. It was a long way to go. A journey of a year and a half. That's a long distance. And that country is called Azareth. Then they dwelt there until the last times, now. And now, when they're about to come again. Now, I explain a lot of this after, I won't go into it now, uh, you can read that in the book. But it's absolutely fascinating, and others have said the same thing, and I think there's, um, this is actually here in, in a comment from article in Relief Society magazine, October 1919, July 1920. Azra, land beyond the pole, forwarded by John Bringham, who allegedly discovered this manuscript diary telling of the experiences of the author, a sole survivor of a wrecked whaling vessel in the Arctic Ocean, and his encounter with the lost tribes of Israel, who reside in a hidden polar country in extreme north. And the source of that is www.subterraneanbases.com guide in earth. Wow, that's wild. I tell you, this book is <laughs> shot, it's shot full of stuff beyond your imagination. I just, I mean, I'm a scientist myself. I studied electronic maths, physics. I studied lots of science. I love science. But I tell you, this kind of stuff blows me away because our, our point of reference is blown out the water. It's not good to ever think you know it all. It's wrong because we don't. We just know a tiny bit and we see things from one angle while there's, there's many angles to many, nearly all situations. So a true scientist will never be arrogant and say he knows it all and lord it over others and make them feel like idiots because they don't know what he knows. No. A true scientist is open to new possibilities, new angles. He's humble about what he knows. That's the way we're supposed to be. Well, that's enough. Enough rambling for me. <laughs> <laughs>
And thank you so much, Stephen Strutt. And you'll find the link to where you can buy his latest book, Ezra's Insights, below, as well as his other Insights series of books. Also, the link to Stephen's YouTube channel if you'd like to subscribe. This is Chris Glynn signing off and looking forward to being back with you again soon for another amazing Nightlight podcast. Bye for now.